the hell is going on? What's really going on? We said, what the hell happened? You don't have to know what the hell is on it. They, they see what's going on. I don't know what's going on. What is going on? We must find out what is going on. Hi, I'm Mark Thiessen. Hi, I'm Danielle Fedka. And welcome to our new podcast. Okay, Mark, you've got to stop saying it's, it's our new true. podcast. It's true. It's still new. <laughs> For Mark, everything is new. <laughs> Wait, I can't figure out why that's an insult, but still, I'm sure it must be. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about Venezuela. So what's unbelievable to me is that we have, not far from our southern border, a country which has, first of all, gone from being the richest country in South America to being one of the world's basket cases in which people are actually starving to death. 94% of Venezuelans live in poverty, widespread power outages, lack of food. I mean, literally people dying in the street. People eating their pets. Yes. Right. And at the same time, this is a narco hub. We're looking at the kind of drug trafficking that is being run out of the president's office by senior military leaders. They are interfering in their neighbor's business. They are being run, basically run, as our colleague Roger Noriega says, micromanaged by Cuban intelligence. The Iranians are there. The Russians are there. But this isn't on the front page every day. And they have income inequality. <laughs> Bill, you've, you've got, I mean, literally, you've got, I mean, we, talk, we're, we spend a lot of time talking about socialism in America today. You want to see socialism? Income inequality. You've got people literally eating their pets to survive. And you've got the regime is run by people who are literally billionaires based on money laundering, narco trafficking, drug running. Supporting uh, uh, terrorism. Supporting terrorism. And, you know, you know the, the, the reality is this, is this is what socialism produces. This is what this is the natural uh, res result of socialism. And all the pe all the people on the left say, you know, when we talk about Cuba and how, how impoverished Cuba is, well, it's because of the embargo. Yeah. Well, there's no embargo on Venezuela. This is purely a, a result of the decisions made by corrupt socialist neo-communist government leaders who are enriching themselves at the expense of ordinary people in what a country that has vast oil resources should be, was once, and should be one of the richest country, uh, countries in the hemisphere. And they're being helped by the sort of rogues gallery of countries around the, the world. of evil, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you write that, Mark? I did not. <laughs> Are you sure? I just feel like you must have. <laughs> <laughs> so Bernie Sanders thought it was a great uh, a great place, wasn't it? Wasn't it Bernie yeah. Sanders who said that Venezuela is an example for us? Well, not not recently. <laughs> <Good. laughs> we go back a little bit in Bernie Sanders' uh, way, but I mean, also the other thing that's happening there, Danny, is there there are death squads uh, wandering around Venezuela. There was a UN report that just came out, and we're going to ask our guest Elliot Abrams about this in a few minutes. Uh, there was a UN report that came out that the Maduro regime has been sending death squads to kill young men and staging the scenes to look like they had resisted arrest. And they killed roughly 5,000, 6,000 people last year and another uh, 1,800 this year so far. So we literally have a, a, you know, I remember when the left was very upset about death squads in, in El Salvador and in Chile and other countries around the, around the hemisphere. All of a sudden, there's, there's this silence about the fact that there's a regime carrying out death squad murders right, you know, right, you know, not far from our southern border. Well, I mean, we make fun and we talk about the politics and we talk about socialism, but the truth is it's just a, it's a heartbreaking story. And it is the, one of the few areas where I can say a lot of good things about the Trump administration. Yes. Yes, says Mark eagerly. That's right. You can, <laughs> finally, Danny. Uh, it's, it, it, it's true. The Trump administration has worked multilaterally. Effectively, the Trump administration has actually shown genuine leadership. It has kept a coalition together uh, in, in trying to isolate Maduro. It has pushed really hard. It has not resorted to the military option. They have been pretty impressive. I still don't know what their end game is, but I've been impressed more than in many other instances with how this has been handled. That's why I'm really excited about our guest today. We just got back from the State Department where we were talking to Elliot Abrams. He is the special representative of the president for Venezuela, but that's not 
his only position. He has worked for, I think, almost every president uh, for the last 25 years or so. He worked for Ronald Reagan. He worked for George Bush. He's working, obviously, for, for Donald Trump. He is a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. But when I first met him, he was the Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs. So he's really come full circle back to that. And probably no person in U.S. government history has had a hand in removing more tyrannical regimes successfully uh, from power through the power of diplomacy and American force than Elliot Abrams. So he's going to be a great guest to listen to on this. So with that, let's listen. Elliot Abrams, welcome to our podcast, What the Hell is Going On? We feel this is an apropos question about almost every national security matter. And today we really want to talk to you about what the hell, and I mean that, what the hell is going on in Venezuela? Okay, happy to do it. So let, let's start with some real basics for people who aren't paying close attention, which is most everybody, I think, uh, to what is going on. Help set us up. How did we get where we are today? We got to where we are today through 20 years of Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro running a dictatorship or what has become a dictatorship in Venezuela and destroying their political system and their economy. Uh, the destruction of the economy is almost unbelievable in the sense that we've seen this where there's a giant natural disaster or war. Nobody's ever seen anything like this in a country that is not at war and hasn't had, you know, an earthquake or something. This was the strongest economy in Latin America. It was. It was the richest country in Latin America because it has these massive oil reserves. And what they have done, giving you an example, uh, five years ago, exporting three million barrels a day of oil. Today, down to about 750,000. The electrical system, blackout after blackout after blackout because of lack of maintenance private property not respected. I mean, you can go down the entire list. So you now have a country, 30, let's say 34 million, of which 4 million are now refugees. It will hit 5 million by the end of this year unless there is political change in Venezuela. The burden on the neighbors is huge. Peru, Ecuador, uh, mostly Colombia, where there's uh, more than a million and a half Venezuelan refugees. The Dutch islands, Aruba, Curacao, huge communities given the tiny size of those islands. For the first time, a location in South America for the Russians and the Cubans and the Chinese. And we should talk about that we some will. more. So they have turned Venezuela into a great disaster and humanitarian catastrophe. Before I hand over to Mark, the one thing that I think a lot of people are going to ask themselves is, how did we let it get so bad? Because you know Chavez was in power for a long time and was obviously intent on being the dictator that he became. Why did we not deal with it when it was easy? You know, uh, Chavez was initially elected democratically as a popular leader. So he was pursuing policies we didn't like, but you know, that's his business. I mean, elected, democratically elected president. Uh, then he died. And Maduro, who had been vice president, took over. And these last years under Maduro, the last six years, uh, have been the worst by far. And <laughs> you may see where I'm heading, which is toward Barack Obama. That is, the Obama administration really played footsie, I would say, with the Maduro regime and did not push back on, particularly on the, on the human rights side, thought they could deal with them, much as they did with Cuba. So the worst of this decline, politically, economically, and from a humanitarian point of view, was under the Obama administration, and I think they have a lot to answer for. So, Elliot, let me ask you just a fundamental question. Donald Trump has pursued a America first foreign policy, though he's been, you know, take it to put Venezuela on a higher priority. Why is that and why should Americans care about this problem? Right. Well, there are a number of um, reasons. One, they're destabilizing the whole region. I mean, when you have a refugee flow that's now four million heading toward five million, and if nothing happens in Venezuela, it'll hit six, it'll hit seven. It can destabilize all of the countries of the region, then go north toward the islands and ultimately toward the United States. You're talking about a massive refugee flow, which has got to be of concern to us. Secondly, you're talking about 
the Cubans, the Russians, the Chinese, who, you know, have had Cuba for a long time, but they haven't had anything in South America, really. Now you find thousands and thousands of Cuban intelligence agents in Venezuela. Uh, you find Maduro in extremis now reaching out to Iran. So from a national security point of view, this is not a trivial matter. I don't want to uh, exaggerate it, but it's something that we obviously need to be uh, concerned about. And then we just say oil. I mean, there is one unified global oil market. So we do need to be concerned about what is really still the largest oil reserves in the world. So so talk a little bit more about what Foreign Minister Zarif of Iran was just in Caracas. Talk a little bit about what Iran is doing in Venezuela, what Russia is doing in Venezuela. I understand that Putin sent uh, 400 members of the Wagner Group there to provide personal security for for Maduro. Talk about what these regimes that are really a threat to our country, how they're turning Venezuela into sort of their own personal fiefdom. They're on a spectrum here. The ones who are most involved are the Cubans, because they're getting, last month it was about 80,000 barrels a day of free oil. This saves them. You know, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Cuban economy collapsed. And what saved them was Venezuelan oil from Hugo Chavez, now from Nicolas Maduro. I don't see how the economy of Cuba survives without it. So they're desperate to keep Maduro in place. In order to keep him in place, they have maybe 2,500 intelligence agents in the army, in the National Guard, in all the intelligence agencies. And to give you a sense of how deeply they're in this, the personal bodyguard group that surrounds Nicolas Maduro does not consist of Venezuelans. It consists of Cubans. I, I think the Cubans are the central nervous system of this regime. If you ask, you know, well, why, if the situation is so terrible, why hasn't the army acted? Why no coup? I think the answer is the Cubans because they permeate the high command, so they're spying on everyone. Any general knows that if you get involved in any kind of, never mind coup plotting, discussions in which you say that you're unhappy with the situation and something's got to change, you will likely end up being tortured in a Venezuelan prison and maybe end up dead. The Russians see this as, I think, primarily a way to stick their finger in our eye. Uh, this is classic Putin. It's pretty cheap for them, but they're very helpful to the regime. We put on economic sanctions at the end of January. What did the regime do? They immediately turned to the Russians, to Rosneft, the oil company, to its chairman, Igor Sechin, who is one of Putin's great buddies, and said, help, uh, help us sell oil. We used to sell to the Americans. Help us buy refined products we need. Help us with the financing. Find us a bank. But the Russians are also taking advantage financially. A year ago, last summer, Venezuela owed Rosneft $8 billion. At the end of this summer, it'll be down to about a billion. So they're, they're trying to get out. They're trying to get their money out. And by the way, they do sell, for example, refined products like gasoline, kerosene at a huge markup. And they buy the oil at a huge discount. So they're really squeezing Venezuela dry while they can do it. These are their great friends and allies. The Russians have mm, order of magnitude 150 military people on the ground. It's not a huge number. Helping maintain the Russian military equipment that they've sold to Venezuela over the last 20 years. What they've said to us in private is, you know, we don't care that much about Nicolas Maduro. Maduro can come or go, but we have legitimate investments in Venezuela that we want to maintain. And they do. They, I mean, in the sense... They want to maintain this foothold on the mainland of South America. They won't fight for it. They're not putting any new money in. They're taking money out. But as long as they can stay, they will, mostly to show you think it's your hemisphere, you Americans, but we're there too. For the Chinese, it's more of a, um, an economic deal. Uh, they put money in over the last decade. They want it out. The argument we've made to them is, well, that's fine. You're not going to get it out while Nicolas Maduro is there because he's destroying the economy. The Chinese are not helpful at all, but they're not in there as deep as the Russians are. Finally, Iran, they did not have much of a presence until this year. And now the regime is turning to them as it's turning to everybody, asking for military help, intelligence help, economic help. Uh, there aren't too many Iranians there. I would not exaggerate the Hezbollah presence. 
uh, I would say it's mostly fundraising. It's not operational. So let me pursue this Iran question a little bit. Uh, over the years, there have been reports about Iran having interest about flights between Caracas and Tehran, of shipping between Caracas and Tehran. Um, and one man has often been at the center of that story, a fellow named Tarek al Asaimi, who was the interior minister of Venezuela before. Now he has another portfolio. But you seem less concerned uh, about this. Is it? Is this? Is this like a, you know, a target of opportunity for the Iranians, or is it actually a point of entry into South America? Is it a point of entry into the United States? You're, you, I'm sur a little surprised to hear you downplay it, actually. Yeah, well, let's start with Tariq al Asami, who's worth mentioning. As you say, he was minister. He was vice president for a while. <clears throat> the United States sanctioned him last year. Uh, sanctioning him, what does that mean? Well, among other things, it means we can freeze his assets in the United States. What, did, what was there? What did we freeze? $600 million. Nice. I mean, the, the amount of corruption in this regime is utterly beyond belief. The intelligence community estimates the amount of money stolen by individuals like him, $200 billion. This is mostly crime. Uh, it's drug trafficking, which, by the way, is another reason we should be concerned. If you look at the, how does Colombian cocaine, for example, get to the United States? It's brought east across the border into Venezuela, and it comes from Venezuela north. So uh, that is yet another reason. But the, the Iranians, I mean, for one thing, like the Russians, like the Chinese, they know that the future of this regime is poor, so they're not going to invest a lot of money. You know, operationally, where we see Hezbollah and Iran is mostly in the southern cone, the so-called triangle area, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, <clears throat> it's where you see operations. You don't see terrorist operations by Iran in Venezuela. You see a diplomatic presence. It is, you, you see them you know, helping with things like getting gold out so it can be sold on the market. And they provide passports, or have historically provide pass, provided passports to Iranians who don't want to go on their Iranian documentation, That's right? right. That's right. I mean, they're helpful to Iran. But again, I, it is not a center of terrorist activity the way the southern cone can sometimes be said to be. Can I ask you a question that you mentioned? Because the narco issue is something that, you know, Roger Noriega, who works with us at AEI, this is something that he's written about a lot. And when he's talked about Venezuela, one of the things that he said is that the loyalty to the regime that you talked about, why hasn't there been a coup, um, that a lot of the loyalty to the regime relates much more to the shared criminal undertakings, that basically all of them have gotten rich this way and that they are afraid that under another regime, they may not remain rich. They may not be able to hold on to their assets. Do you see that as a factor as well? Yes. Probably we shouldn't even talk about loyalty to the regime, right? It's a, it's a kind of business decision. The corruption is extremely widespread. Financial corruption, government contracts, and also drug trafficking, or being paid to look the other way. Uh, so you don't interfere with someone else's drug trafficking in the western part of the country near Colombia. Um, it's true, I think it's mostly true of the higher ranks, which is why one of the things I've wondered is, if there were a military coup, would it be a colonel's coup, not a general's coup? Middle Eastern style. In Middle East, I mean, when we think of, remember, it was Colonel Gaddafi, it was Colonel Nasser. By the way, it was also Colonel Chavez. They have not participated, obviously, in the same way generals have. I should add, one of the things that Chavez and Maduro have done to try to keep the military on side is they've promoted everyone. Venezuela has more generals than NATO. <laughs> uh, you know, That's literally. awesome. Yes, it's, I mean, it's really true. Well, you know, I, we, we say this in Washington all the time. Titles are free. Yes, so they've done that. Um, yeah, and one of the things that's going to have to happen, I mean, let's be realistic here. If there is a political deal that gets Maduro out, a piece of it is going to be some kind of amnesty because there are too many people in the military, but also just in the, uh, in the governing party, in, in uh, Venezuela in general, who are compromised by this regime and are going to seek some guarantees for their future. And, you know, if you look at um, South American transitions to democracy over the last, you know, 30 years, years or so, they've always come with some kind of uh, amnesty that uh, protects people so that they're willing to go along. 
Right. Compromise is going to be a bitter pill. It is. What, what we've said, we the United States government, is, look, it's your country. You can do whatever deal you want. But just realize we make no deals with drug traffickers. So you, you can make a deal and you can let a guy off and you can say, well, you know, he can be a minister or whatever. We will still have a case against him. And if he ever sets foot here, we'll arrest him. So, Elliot, look, the Trump administration deserves a lot of credit for elevating the problem in Venezuela. I mean, the president was right to back Guaido. Uh, he helped well rally uh, international support for Guaido, and lots of countries have recognized him as a legitimate president. He led the effort to, to isolate the regime, sanctioned all these Maduro cronies and all the rest of it, cut off uh, American payments for Venezuelan oil. These are all good things. But in April, you know, we basically we, we made a play to uh, try and uh, to try and over, uh, remove him. Not it's not a coup because Guaido is the legitimate president, but but it failed. Um, why did that effort fail? And what lessons have you learned from that failure to change U.S. policy toward uh, in terms of how to get rid of Maduro going forward? Well, you were right in saying that Juan Guaido is the legitimate interim president of Venezuela because he's the president of the National Assembly and the presidential election they had last year was a, was a fraud. It was a fake. Um, what, first of all, what happened April 30th was not, I think you said, our play, that is, the Americans. It was something that a bunch of Venezuelans were negotiating with the head of the intelligence service, who is here in the United States now. He, he, um, he fled. He came over to our side. Uh, the head of the army, the head of the Supreme Court. Uh, so why did it fail? There are a lot of theories about this, and I wouldn't say I'm sure of which is right. There was one theory that, you know, it was penetrated by the Cubans from the start, and they let it run to see who was involved. Another theory uh, is that it was premature. They advanced the date by a day because they thought the government had found out, the regime, rather, had found out. Um, they clearly and, had. Well, so the date, the timing was wrong, so it didn't work. We are continuing with our uh, policy, which is one of, of keeping the pressure on the regime. Uh, building the pressure. Every week, every week, we announce new uh, sanctions, and we will continue to do that. Uh, we continue to build the international coalition, the latest country to join it. That is to say, to recognize Juan Guaido as the legitimate interim president of Venezuela was Greece, which did it last week when Mitsotakis won the election. On his second day in office, he recognized Guaido, which was pretty terrific. And other countries, we think, will, will follow. What we can't do is tell you when, what day, what week, what hour will this regime come to an end. But we're pretty confident that, um, that it will because it has no solutions to Venezuela's problems, this terrible crisis. And we saw it with this most recent blackout. Whole country went down on uh, the 22nd. Well, that's because you launched an EMP attack, right? Uh, That's what Maduro <laughs> said, that you got, the United States launched well, the only, an EMP attack. The, only, the question is, was it the president? Was it me? Was it Marco Rubio? Is what they said last time. Um, <laughs> Keep this equipment at your house, Elliot. I just, I'm curious. <laughs> no, it's brain, it's brain waves, actually. There's no equipment. Now we understand. But so fair enough. Uh, fair enough. You know, you say he can't hold on. We said the same thing about Bashar al-Assad in not dissimilar circumstances. In fact, I would say worse <clears throat> circumstances. And yes, it's true, we're doing more in Venezuela than perhaps we were willing to do in the Obama administration against Assad. But the ability of this guy to hold on, you know, he, he has to hold on, and the Cubans have to have him hold on. Why are you optimistic? Well, <clears throat> it's a very good question. There are others who people said couldn't you know, destroying the country, how can Mugabe in Zimbabwe? Um, but Mugabe, Zimbabwe was a case where I think the very deep tribal division had a lot to do with his being able to hold on. Syria and Venezuela are not comparable in a couple of ways. First, look where Syria is. Venezuela is in the Western Hemisphere, surrounded by democracies which want that government out. Brazil, Colombia, Peru, uh, Argentina. This is not the situation of Syria. And perhaps more important, that regime would have fallen in Syria except for one thing. Iran and Hezbollah were ready to fight and die and kill to preserve it. And we know that thousands of Hezbollah soldiers and Iranian Revolutionary Guard soldiers went to Syria to fight for that regime. 
That is not happening in Venezuela. Nobody's fighting for this regime. They're willing to um, put people in jail for this regime. That they do. The oppression is very great. But there aren't going to be foreign troops uh, defending this regime as there were in Syria. So, you know, one of the problems Roger Noriega brings up when we talk to him about this is that these narco generals, you know, when the people who we were flip, who were trying to flip in April, or the defense minister, we're talking about the, you know, the senior, senior people. These are all people who are compromised, who have billions of dollars at stake through narco profit, trafficking and other other organized crime. And you mentioned that, you know, if it's going to be a coup, it'd probably be a coup of colonels. Is it a mistake to try and have a strategy that's focused on flipping? these senior people with billions of dollars at, at stake? Because one, if we, let's say it succeeds, then we've just got Chavismo light and we've got a bunch of drug traffickers still in charge of the country. And two, they're the least likely to flip because they're the ones who have the most at stake. Shouldn't we be doing effectively what you did in the 1980s in Nicaragua, which is to go and find those those colonels and below junior officers uh, who are patriotic, who are not corrupt, who have not been bought off by the, by drug trafficking, and help them overthrow the regime, not with U.S. forces, but with U.S. aid and intelligence and support, and you know, put Guaido in power. No, um, first I dispute your history. That probably another podcast. <laughs> and what you had in Nicaragua in the 1980s was the largest peasant rebellion in the history of Latin America not created by the United States or the National Guard. It was spontaneous because of the oppression of the communist regime. But I, I don't think... And the opposition in Venezuela is spontaneous, too. It's just that in Nicaragua, we came in and supported the, supported the peasant rebellion. So why don't we do the same thing? What you're seeing in Venezuela is not a, you know, a peasant rebellion in the countryside, not at all. You are, you are seeing resistance to this regime that is very widespread. Every, every week... Uh, Guaido goes to a different part of the country, most recently Margarita Island. Prior to that, a, a city called Barinas, which was actually Hugo Chavez's birthplace. Huge crowds, despite the fact that, you know, there are censorship, so there's no TV announcements, there's no way of letting people know. It's word of mouth. Uh, huge crowds. But uh, I would dispute your characterization of our policy as um, you're trying to flip a few generals. We're not. We're trying to... Well, let me use a good Marxist term to heighten the contradictions. That is, we are putting enormous uh, pressure on those individuals. We're putting pressure on the regime's ability to get money. And uh, the income for the regime is way, way down. One of the reasons they're selling gold is that it's one of the few things that they are able to sell, uh, mostly in the Middle East. So we're, we're putting pressure on the whole system. Yes, we think that there are a lot of generals who are now saying, well, you know, this, this whole system is collapsing, including my own little economic empire. We think there are people in the military who are not corrupt who are saying something has to give here. We think there are many civilians, even in the PSUV, which is the old Hugo Chavez party, the Chavista party, who realize that Nicolas Maduro is destroying their party, destroying their brand, if you will. So I think there are a lot of Venezuelans even on the left, who realize that Maduro is just, you know, complete total failure in destroying the country. And again, you know, when the, there will be enough of them in the right places to bring down the regime, I don't know. Will it be, I, you know, maybe it's a military coup. Maybe it's a regime coup. Maybe it's a negotiation. Uh, we don't know the answer to that. But we continue ahead with this policy of, uh, if you will, trying to crack the regime with our pressures on it. But I guess the, the, the problem is, is that it seems like the strategy is to crack the regime from the top, whereas in a place like Nicaragua, there was a grassroots effort to remove the regime from below. Um, and that that succeeded incredibly. We ended up with democratic elections and, you know, it fell apart later on, but it had nothing to do with the failure of the strategy. Why is our strategy so top down and not bottom up? You know, well, well, let me add a, Let me add a, a P.S. to that. Um, it also seems like the president is very reluctant to add the threat, not even the, the actual fact of, but the threat of military action, which would give credibility to, to our effort. Well, again, I dispute this idea that it's just a, a top-down policy trying to flip a few generals or something. Juan Guaido 
announced um, on the anniversary, well, on the date that, that uh, Maduro should have been leaving office, his term was up, um, that as president of the National Assembly, it seemed to fall on him under their constitution to be interim president. The National Assembly agreed with that. We agreed with that, and our policy has been one of total support for Guaido, including helping find 54 other countries that, that are supporting Juan Guaido. Uh, are, we giving him, are we also giving him access to frozen Venezuelan assets in the United let's, States? Let's come back to that. We okay. can't do that. Um, but the, the policy is fundamentally one of supporting Guaido and supporting the Democratic opposition, supporting the National Assembly, the last democratic institution in the country. So I don't, I think, I mean, that's, if you will, a bottom-up strategy, supporting the democratic movement in Venezuela. But you are right. We're doing it peacefully. We're not doing it through arms. Why? Well, one reason is most of them don't want us to. The last thing Venezuelan would really need is a lot more bloodshed. Secondly, if you look at the, the coalition we have, again, of 55 countries that support Juan Guaido, we will destroy that coalition if we keep thundering about military intervention that the Latin Americans don't want, that the Europeans don't want. Um, you might be able to find two or three countries that are saying in private, yeah, you should go invade Venezuela. Um, so uh, you won't find many more than that. So I don't think that that is a smart policy. Now, we do say, I, I'm you know, constantly telling people, if you had said to George H.W. Bush in 1988, say when he was vice president, you know, you're going to be invading Panama in a year or two, he'd have said, you're out of your mind. No one can predict the future. We obviously have the military capability to do that. Um, it is not something that anybody should be wishing for because there'd be a lot of um, there'd be a lot of damage, and I don't think personally that that's needed to uh, bring this regime down. Now, if we're so happy with Juan Guaido, which we are, I think he's an amazing political talent. Why don't we give him access to these uh, accounts? Um, first, Venezuela owes a lot of people a lot of money. There are lots of creditors in the United States, creditors of the government, uh, bondholders, for example, creditors of uh, PDVSA, the Venezuelan National Oil Company. The minute, not the minute, the second <laughs> you unfreeze those accounts, boom, their lawyers will be in court demanding, give that money to me. So that's the first problem. Second problem is if you look at the financial institutions, you say, give it to Juan Guaido, you know what their lawyers say, whoa, 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 whoa. What if we're sued? You know, what if you don't succeed and three months from now you get a lawsuit? That... So the people who hold the funds here and in Europe as well, banks, the Bank of England, uh, which holds a billion, two hundred million dollars in Venezuelan gold, they are reluctant to do it. People are ready to pounce on those assets. Uh, what we were attempting to do, we, the administration now, is get Guaido's team so that he can pay for embassies, ambassadors, uh, a National Assembly office in Caracas, $41.5 million in, in money uh, that is not going to be spent in the Northern Triangle in Central America. And we have not yet been able to persuade Congress to allow us to reprogram those funds. Uh, but that's what we'd like to do. We'd like to use um, US funds to do it. What about the Norwegian-led talks? Um, I think one of the, well, first of all, <laughs> everything about that sentence, Norwegian-led talks, makes me, me, me <laughs> grab, grab my wallet. Um, but is this, is this something that, that we have confidence in? And are you worried that the, these talks will actually end with elections that Maduro can participate in, that there can be a process that takes the heat off, not from, not from the Trump administration, but from everybody else. You know, these coalitions are always impossible. Um, how, how confident slash worried are you about it? Well, these are very important um, points you're raising. Um, I have no criticism to offer Norway for trying to negotiate this. It's a good faith effort on their part. And they do have lessons to teach Venezuela ultimately because they are an oil-rich country that used its oil resources well rather than having vast uh, corruption and incompetence. Now, this is the third round of negotiations. Both of the first rounds were abused by the Maduro regime. 
merely to one, buy time, and two, try to divide the opposition. So one has to be worried about these talks. Guaido and his team know this. I mean, they lived through that the previous rounds. And um, we are, of course, counseling them to, to you know, keep your eyes open. And the talks could break down today, this week, next week. They could easily uh, break down if the regime offers nothing or you know, fraudulent choices. One of those fraudulent choices, which it may well offer, is, yes, we can have presidential elections, you know, 18 months from now. Obviously, Nicolas Maduro is president. He'll preside over the elections. But we'll have a new elections commission, and these will be free and fair elections. And then he'll go. Um, That amazingly poor lying proposition has actually gotten some support in the EU. Of course. Uh, And I've had conversations, and I've had conversations where EU officials say, we'll flood the zone with election observers. Now, the answer to that is, and you know what will happen? Let's suppose that they are there, and let's suppose they're honest. So you have an election a year and a half from now, January 2021, and of course they try to steal it. And the election observers say, oh, these were not fair elections. That is exactly what happened in May 2018. There were observers. And they said Maduro stole the election. So what? He's still sitting there. So this is a really bad plan. And we have made it clear. We are not lifting our sanctions while Nicolas Maduro is in power. We don't, uh, in a sense, care what deal is made. If Nicolas Maduro is in power, we are not lifting our sanctions. And, you know, it's not an ideological issue. Think about it. Maduro is there. He's sitting in the presidential palace. He's got the army, the National Guard, the military intelligence, civilian intelligence. He's got 2,500 Cubans. He's got these so-called armed colectivos, which are gangs. You're going to have a free election? This is ridiculous. If you're an average Venezuelan, you're sitting in your home, and the news comes on, a deal has been reached. And Nicolas Maduro is going to stay as president, but he's going to have free elections. You laugh because you know they're not going to be free. You think you're going to believe in a secret ballot? So this is a really bad deal, a really bad compromise. And we are saying that to the European Union and to the Venezuelans. Don't fall for that because he will stay in power and there will not be free elections. And I think the regime guys think, well, he won't run again, Maduro, because he's a bad candidate. So they'll find somebody who's a better candidate. And then maybe Guaido runs, but they can pay to get another one or two apparently Democratic candidates. And then you divide the opposition, and then they might actually do win an election. So uh, this is a really, really bad idea. Um, that's why we say Maduro's got to go. So there's a UN report out that the Maduro has been sending death squads to kill young men and then stage the crime scene to look like it, they were resisting arrest and that as many as 7,000 people have been killed this way. I mean, that's far worse than anything. You know, the left goes crazy about Pinochet. That's far worse than happened there or in a lot of other Central American countries during the 1980s. That's a lot of people. Uh, you've got Maduro. So Maduro is involved in death squads. He and his regime are involved in narco trafficking. First of all, can you tell us about the death squads? But also the second question is, why haven't we indicted Maduro and his top officials and like offered rewards uh, for anyone who will who will take them and hand them over to the United States? First, um, <clears throat> it is worthwhile comparing to Chile under Pinochet. Pinochet ruled for 17 years. In those 17 years, a couple of hundred people were killed and 200,000 refugees. Venezuela, 5,000 people killed in a year according to the UN, and 4 million refugees. Um, it's, it's, it just shows you the, the depth of this uh, collapse and crisis and repression in, in Venezuela. Um, the death squads in question are organized, obviously, by the regime. Actually, the UN report has a very good description of them, of you know, guys going in masks, wearing balaclavas, and looking for individuals who they believe were participating in demonstrations, uh, shooting them, uh, and then, you know, planting a gun or something. You know, the, the, um, the former head of the intelligence service, Christopher Figuera, who went into hiding and then left the country after the April 30th attempt to overthrow Duro failed, has mentioned a couple of cases where um, 
for example, the first deputy vice president of the National Assembly was arrested and charged with you know, terrorism and things because there were guns in his house. And uh, Christopher has said, well, those guns were planted, and I know it, he said, because I planted them. I mean, I was, you know, I was a guy who ordered this, so we know that this has happened. It happened also in the case of the um, chief of staff to Guaido, a guy named Roberto Morero. Same charges, same planting of, of guns. On the indictment question, you know, um, this is a DOJ question. So if you're thinking, oh, now he's going to duck. Yes, <laughs> I'm going to duck. You know, they, they, um, there are indictments of some Venezuelans. Uh, for example, two nephews of Maduro's wife, the former first lady, are in a Florida federal prison convicted on drug trafficking charges. There are, I am told, other indictments that are sealed indictments. Um, so there's Wh not why? much. Why? Why sealed? Why? Uh, I, I'm just, doesn't make sense, does I, it? You know, you need, you, you've got to talk to DOJ about these things. <laughs> I, you know, I've been, I've been carefully trying to stay away from, from talking too much about what they do. What we have told Venezuelans, by the way, who have, uh, people connected to the regime who've come to us and said, I want to cooperate, and, but I don't want to be indicted. And what we said to them is, we don't do indictments in the State Department. You go talk to DOJ. And many of them have. I mean, I've been told by people at DOJ, many of them have American lawyers and are talking about, uh, well, what kind of a plea deal might there be? How many years would I have to serve? Uh, but we, you know, that's Department of Justice business. I've got two exit questions for you. Uh, the one, uh, one is probably easier than the other. I don't know which is easier. Um, there have been suggestions that, uh, by some, that Guaido is surrounded by bad guys. They're opportunistic bad guys. They're bad guys who will, um, who, who've turned on Maduro, who believe that, that, they're, that the future's not going to be with Maduro, but they're nonetheless narcos. They're nonetheless traffickers, and they see him as a, a weak leader that they can hide behind. Not that Guaido himself is a bad guy, but that he is actually surrounded by people, including, including one man, uh, this, this fellow Gorin, who has actually been indicted in U.S. courts. What do you say to that? Um, there's never been, first, even a whisper, even by the regime, of accusations against Juan Guaido for any kind of... Um, uh, illegal conduct, much less uh, drug trafficking. Secondly, I think that's wrong. I know many of the people around Guaido. Unfortunately, I know them because many of them have been forced into exile. He is part of the generation, it's called the generation of 2007, people who rose up uh, then against the Chavez dictatorship. Uh, these are all guys who are now, you know, 35, give or take. Um, and it's a very inspiring group of young democratic political leaders. Uh, none of whom have any money. Um, there is a problem here that you point to that I mentioned before the $200 billion stolen. There's a lot of illicit money out there. And a lot of those guys want to buy back in. Uh, some of them are in exile, been in exile for years. They want to get back in the game, so they offer money to the regime and to Guaido. He's aware of this. He's very careful about this. According to the press reports, uh, Gorin was involved in the April 30th efforts, uh, but he was not involved on behalf of Guaido. I'd say he was involved on behalf of Gorin. Um, we're aware of this, and uh, Guaido is very much aware of it. Uh, so I would have to say I am worried in the long run, including in a democratic Venezuela. Maduro's gone. Free elections. I am worried about the influence of drug traffickers and of all of that outside money but I'm not worried about its influence on Juan Guaido. So, you know, the, the reports are that Trump basically felt that he was led down a, a primrose path, that, uh, that he had said that he knew people like Maduro and that Maduro wasn't going to go easily and he had a feeling this was going to go badly. And that, quite frankly, there's reports that he's kind of lost interest in Venezuela. Uh, you don't hear him talking about it very much anymore. Has the president lost interest in Venezuela? And also, what are the consequences for U.S. prestige and for the region, if after having backed Guaido and and uh, he that Maduro remains in power, what are the consequences of failure? First, um, the notion that the president has lost interest is just it's just nonsense. I remember when that you know journalists go in packs, and I remember when the first of those stories emerged some weeks ago, and it happened to be on a day when 
Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau was visiting the president, and they spent a lot of time discussing Venezuela. And on that very day, Vice President Pence was in Miami to see off the USS Comfort, the hospital ship, which was making a, a tour of uh, the Caribbean and northern part of South America to treat uh, mostly Venezuelan refugees. Um, and the vice president wouldn't have, wouldn't have done that if he thought, oh, we don't care about this anymore. So it's not uh, true. And I see it in the conduct of the president, the vice president, the secretary of state, uh, the secretary of the treasury, the secretary of commerce. There's an enormous continuing interest in Venezuela. Um, is the president frustrated? You bet. I am frustrated. Juan Guaido is frustrated. We're all frustrated, of course. The suffering in Venezuela, the refugee flow, is just terrible. And we just saw another blackout, so it's getting worse, not better. But that does not mean we're going to change the policy. We're not, because we think the policy is, is the right one. If the policy fails, if a year from now we sit down together again and Maduro is still there, sure, uh, it's bad for the United States. It's bad for our prestige. It's bad for our foreign policy. But that is not my major worry. Um, a year from now, there will be maybe 6 million Venezuelan refugees, and the country's collapse will have an enormous impact on the neighboring countries. Uh, there might be an increase in the Chinese, Russian, Cuban role. I'm worried about the real world consequences and above all, in, um, in Venezuela, ask yourself a question, by the way, if there's no electricity, there are no pumps, there's no water, you start seeing communicable diseases, you already begin to see that, they know no borders. So this is a disaster that is growing. Um, that's what worries me most. But I don't think that's going to happen. I have confidence in our policy. Uh, I cannot tell you when, what is it, give me the date when Maduro leaves power, but I really uh, am confident it will happen. I think that when we sit down in a year from now, if you're willing to have us again, we'll, we'll, have, a, we'll have a good story to talk about. We will. We'll do the postmortem on the Maduro regime. Let's hope that's the case. Elliot Abrams, thank you so much for joining this uh, podcast. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. You're very welcome. So that was a really fascinating discussion, Danny. I mean, look, I, th I think, as you said at the outset, Trump administration deserves a lot of credit here. The Obama administration was, you know, rapprochement and detente with the Cuban regime and basically ignoring Maduro's uh, tyranny. And the Trump administration has really elevated this and made it a priority. Uh, they were right to back Juan Guaido. They've rallied Western support for him. It was because of the Trump administration. I think now 56 countries and counting have recognized him as the legitimate leader of Venezuela. They've led the international efforts to isolate Maduro. They sanctioned dozens of his cronies, cut off American payments for Venezuelan oil. These are all good things. But, you know, we just had a situation where, you know, there's a, there's an old saying, if you're going to knock off the king, you better succeed. And we failed. Uh, there was a U.S. back effort to remove Maduro and it failed. And so now it seems like our policy is a little bit stuck. Yeah, I think that's the problem. I mean, you get the sense, all, all credit to, to Elliot's efforts, uh, and I think they're truly admirable, uh, you get the sense that the administration doesn't know where to go right now, uh, that we're kind of treading water. And for Maduro, the calculation is, you know, if I last long enough, eventually everybody will lose interest, which is has been the history of these kinds of sanctions-based isolation efforts. The Cubans have an interest. The Cubans and the Russians are both in the game uh, for the long term. They want to keep him there. And Maduro is going to hold on with his fingernails until someone shoves him out. So, you know, Elliot was more optimistic than honestly I felt. Yeah. I think one of the big problems we have is that Trump, you know, Trump is a non-interventionist. If in order to succeed in diplomacy, you have to have a credible use of force. So Trump thinks of himself more as Reagan than George W. Bush, more peace through strength than shock and all, right? But the reason peace through strength worked is because our adversaries in the Reagan years knew that Ronald Reagan was willing to pull the trigger. I mean, he invented Grenada. He shot missiles at Libya. I feel like saying invaded Grenada isn't ever the way to lead with the credibility well, of a country. So he didn't, but I mean, he didn't start major wars. It was it was actually an important thing back in the 80s, of course. You know, that was... That was you're older than I am, Mark. You're, you're, you know, you know I, I, I was... I, <laughs> no, I'm I was, not, actually. <laughs> 
<laughs> Always the gentleman. But, you know, the point being is that Reagan's cre- threat of force was credible. And I don't think anyone believes that Donald Trump is willing to use any kind of force, even right. not even directly. And so when, you know, John Bolton and other people admirably say all options are on the table, the Russians called our bluff. On, and on, right, on, all options weren't on the table, were, and, and that's not. exactly right. In fact, you know, before you and I went over to talk to Elliot, one of the things that we had in hand was this uh, uh, piece. I think this Axios piece by Jonathan Swan, mm-hmm. another fine Australian, I should add. And... <laughs> Righty. <laughs> So anyway, as I was saying extremely seriously, that this pretty interesting article you know, quote, had, had a bunch of quotes from the president talking about how he views, you know, how he views John Bolton as sort mm-hmm. of, you know, his pet bull on a leash. Yeah. But, I mean, one of the things that was absolutely clear. got to let the leash clear, go sometime. Yeah, but, but one of the things was clear was that, as you said, the president isn't actually interested in, in letting that leash go at all. That, in fact, you know, and I, I think I asked Elliot this specifically, you know, Without the threat of military force, how credible are our efforts in Venezuela? And the answer, you know, Elliot gave a good diplomatic answer, but yeah. not that persuasive. But here's here's what the one thing that Elliot said that disturbed me a little bit was that he said that if we used force or we, you know, even supported uh, indigenous forces on the ground, that that would break up our coalition. One of the principles we established after the 9-11 attacks in the Bush administration was that the mission determines the coalition. The coalition does not determine the mission, right? Just trips and off the lips. It does, doesn't it? But it's true that America needs to decide what is the right thing to do and and do it. And if the people who are willing to be with us and help us, then great. And if people are not willing to do it and be with us, then oh, that's great too. That's fine. Every country makes its own yeah, decisions. Yeah, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be there and, if this isn't our in and the our fundamental interest. problem. And I think Roger Noriega has written about this and and defines it properly, is that flipping narco generals isn't going to get the change in Venezuela that we need because what they're trying to what they want is Chavismo light. They want to continue with their narco traffic and they want to continue enriching themselves and protect their, their at the billions expense of, at, at the, the expense, expense of, of the democracy Venezuela. and the expense of the people at that. And so and there's people who are never going to flip because as Roger points out, you know, a guy who's got a billion dollars in a bank account from narco trafficking doesn't care if the CIA gives him a couple hundred thousand dollars. That's not real money to him. And so you have to what you the way you change things in Venezuela, we've learned from this failed coup. It's not a coup because because he's not the legitimate president. But what we learned from this failed effort is that he's not going to go peacefully. And so what you need to do is you need to go and find the young colonels. So you, Elliot talked about a colonel's revolt. Yes. Um, you know, we need to find the young colonels, the young, the young officers who are not corrupt, who have not been you know, bought off, who are willing to go and join with Guaido and fight to liberate their country. And it doesn't mean we have to lead it. It doesn't mean U.S. troops on the ground fighting in Venezuela, because what Reagan did, and as Elliot well knows with the Sandinistas, is we supported indigenous forces who are right. willing to fight for their own liberation. But a, but a big part of that is putting the squeeze on these generals. And it was really, I got to say, um, you know, not to put Elliot on the spot, um, especially when he's not here, but because uh, this is just you and me in the studio. But It was strange to me that he said, I'm going to stay in my lane here when we asked about the indictments of Uh of the narcos around Maduro, because there haven't been a ton of indictments unless they're sealed. And if they're sealed, then they should be bloody well unsealed. I and there should be a rewards put so out. For I, I don't, I don't, I don't really get that. You know, when you look at Iran, you really see a whole of government strategy, right? You see the Treasury Department, you see the Commerce Department, you see the State Department, the DoD, really the point. CIA, White House. But when you look at Venezuela, I feel like we don't have a whole of government strategy in the same way. Although a Treasury again has been pretty tough, but what about indictments? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing: that there are lots of models of success in the past, right? So we indicted Noriega, right? <laughs> and even more models of failure. <laughs> well, there's tons of models of failure. That's absolutely. So we so we don't want to do Iraq yes. as the model for Venezuela. Hey, okay. that's not that. I well, call that a failure. Well, I'm not calling it a failure, but I'm saying we don't want to, we don't want to invade Slip with hundreds of thousands of troops. Yeah. Uh, but there are models that we can turn to. There's the Contra model where we helped support it and people on the ground. So re- when Reagan came into office, there's we, also the we, Poland there, model that you mentioned. The Poland model where you support the opposition and right. you know with all sorts of support. There's the pan- Panama model, where we indicted Noriega, and we did the, actually invade Panama. Though. We did invade Panama, but with a small force. But you know, so you could you can do some sort of a hybrid of some of these models and come up with a strategy that's more vigorous. Because right now we're stuck in the mud in Venezuela, yeah. and us being stuck in the mud in Venezuela means starvation and deprivation and tyranny. And it also means it also means exactly it means Cuba, Russia, the Chinese, the Iranians, and others are really winning. 
Yeah, well, the one thing we can agree on is we've got good people on the job with uh, with someone like Elliot Abrams, and I'm really glad he was with us on the show. He's a great American. I'm a huge fan, so I'm really grateful as well. Thank you, folks, for listening. Our team here at AEI is Alexa Santry, Matt Winesett, Jen Moretta, and Macy Heath. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI.org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.